Heavenly Father, I thank you that I'm back and well enough to teach. I thank you that others, likewise, Father, have been healed or schedules have been cleared and the day has been organized so that they could join and be a part of the study. We all, Father, are anxious to get back to where we've been, to hear from you, to see your truth, to understand it in a new way, and to reflect as we endeavor to live according to it. I ask, Lord, that all that we try to cover tonight and all that comes in the weeks to follow would be according to your spirit and according to your will and according to your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I promised, we're moving into a new section of our study today. The next 11 chapters recounts the law that God spoke to the nation of Israel through Moses and Moses recorded for us in the book of Exodus. Even getting into this point of our study, we've watched in prior weeks God preparing, slowly preparing the people to receive the law as they made their way from Egypt to this point now at Mount Sinai. The Lord at several points told the the nation that they would be expected to follow all His statutes and to follow all His commandments, that he, He was calling them according to these new standards. Well, now they're finally going to see what those statutes are. They're going to finally learn what His commandments are. And then... Those commandments, that law, will be incorporated into a covenant which then binds the nation to keep those commandments. As we mentioned, I think the last time we studied, the law of God, which is the commandments we will begin studying uh, over the next several weeks, the law of God was incorporated into a covenant at Sinai. The covenant is not the law. The law is not the covenant. These are two different things. The law was in the covenant, but the covenant did not establish the law. It's not as though the law didn't exist until the covenant came along and delivered it. God's law is eternal. It reflects God's holiness. It is the standard for fellowship with God. If men cannot live up to that standard of holiness, then they face the penalty for sin, which is the second death, eternal separation from God. So the law stands apart from the covenant. God didn't need this covenant in order to hold Israel accountable for their sin. No more than he needs it for you or I as Gentiles. Paul has taught that all men are judged by law and those who have it and those who are without it are all judged according to the same law. And if you sin, you fail the test of the law. Only if you accept Christ's penalty paid under the law on our behalf will we escape the second death. So I want to reemphasize There is the law, and then there is this covenant that God delivered to a very specific people group within which he placed his law as a part of that covenant. So the law of God is one thing, the covenant God gave to Israel is another, but the two work together for God's purposes in that nation. Most of the details concerning the purpose of the covenant are not in this book. They're in the other books of the Torah, the Pentateuch, particularly in Deuteronomy. If you were in the Revelation class, you got a a healthy dose of that when we looked at how the purpose of the covenant was ultimately fulfilled in the times of tribulation. We aren't going to study those books in this class, obviously. So our study from this point forward in Exodus is limited to an understanding and a focus on the law itself. Not on the covenant per se, not on the purposes of the covenant in its use of the law. If you want that, as I said, you could get most of that from the Revelation class. Instead, we're focused on the law, the tabernacle, and its purposes and its effect within the nation of Israel and its application today. And along the way, there are some interesting moments in the history of Israel, particularly one involving a golden bovine that we're going to look at uh, when we get there. But before we study the law, before we actually look at what the law says, we're going to have to spend one night on an introduction to the law. And what is this going to cover? Well, first, we're going to understand three guiding principles for understanding and interpreting law properly. And I should probably pause at this point and give you the warning up front. This is going to be more like a seminary class, I guess. This is more of the class where you you wish you could just comp out and and get it later in a shorter way. But this is foundational, and, and I might even go so far as to say Uh, This is the kind of class that can alter your understanding of Scripture forever in a dramatic way because it can reset and and it can correct a lot of misunderstanding concerning how law applies to us as Christians, what its purpose is, how we're to see it and understand it. And so it is important that we go through this 
uh, not the least of which because it will inform what we're going to study later as we look at the law itself, but it has broad applicability. So we need to go through the three guiding principles for understanding and interpreting law. Secondly, we're going to learn the ten reasons God gives the law. God gave Israel the law. Now, it's not ten reasons why the law exists, but ten reasons why God gave it to Israel. Finally, we're going to examine how a Christian is to view the law today in the age of the church. So let's begin by reviewing some general principles for understanding and interpreting the law. The first principle, the law consists of 613 commandments given to Israel by a covenant. And these 613 commandments function only as an indivisible unit. There are a total of 248 positive and 365 negative statutes, as one Jewish rabbi counted. The first 10 of these 613 are the best known, perhaps, but they are no different than the rest, nor can they be separated from the rest. There is no basis in Scripture for separating any of the commandments in the law from the rest of the law. When the Bible speaks of law, of God's law, it always speaks with a view to all 613 of God's commandments, thinking of it as a single entity. As James says in James 2.10, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. According to James, God defines keeping the law successfully as keeping all the commandments and statutes without breaking a single one. That means that no one is more important than any other and that no law is dispensable and that all must be kept, else we are lawbreakers. So even should you think it's possible to keep the first ten, if you break the eleventh or the twelfth or the thirteenth, you've broken all the first ten too. There is no separation in God's view between the first ten and the next 603. In short, it's all or none, according to Scripture. We'll return to this principle later in the study tonight. The second principle, the law is not a means to obtaining righteousness, or salvation, if you will, for anyone. The law of Moses was given to a redeemed people, not to redeem a people, as Dwight Pentecost once said. If there's any doubt concerning that point, we only need to read Paul's letters to gain a proper understanding. And Paul said in, in one place, particularly Galatians 3.11, that no man is justified by law before God is evident for the righteous man shall live by faith. He quotes out of the Old Testament. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. The law was given to Israel for specific purposes, which we're going to study in a moment. But personal salvation was not one of those purposes. Scripture is utterly clear that the law makes nothing perfect. Hebrews 7:19 states that. The law cannot make you perfect, as in salvation, as in righteousness. Furthermore, Paul calls the law in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 a ministry of death. A ministry of death referring to the way the law convicts and condemns everyone. And in Romans 3.20, Paul says that by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. That is, declared righteous. So the second principle is that the purpose of the giving of the law never included, never anticipated, never even had as a possibility making anyone righteous. You cannot become righteous by works of law. And lastly, the third principle is keeping the law in and of itself does not yield greater holiness in a saint, be it an Old Testament saint or a New Testament saint. You cannot be sanctified by working the works of the law. The Old Testament saint was called to live a life of holiness. Yes, one that reflects the holiness of God himself. They were also commanded by the covenant to keep the law as best they could. And when that command, that command to keep the law and to be holy as I am holy, was met by a faithful and obedient heart in the person of the saint, when you put those two things together, the command to be holy and the command to keep the law, and you match that with a heart that is both faithful and obedient, it produces sanctification. 
for that saint who seeks to please the Lord through that obedience. But following law in and of itself does not produce sanctification. The law was simply the structure in which God allowed sanctification to happen in that obedient heart. Another way to say it is the hammer doesn't build the house, the carpenter does. But the hammer can be a useful tool in the hands of a skilled carpenter. So the law in and of itself does not sanctify anyone. That sanctification is only made possible because a faithful heart that seeks to obey God's word is doing what it was commanded to do by that word. That same faithful heart that understands that God would provide a Messiah to remove sin. That same faithful saint that never lost sight of their own unworthiness because the law itself served to remind them of their sin continually. So sanctification is a product of faith that seeks to obey God's word. The keeping of the law was merely the test of faith that was given to the Old Testament saint in Israel. Show me that you love me. Show me that you hear my word and have a heart to obey. How do I show you, Lord? Keep these commandments. We're going to return to that topic again later tonight as well. So before we move to the next section, let's revisit. The law has 613 commandments. When we interpret and understand the purpose of law, we have to understand it is a single entity. There is no breaking it apart and treating sections differently from one another. Secondly, it is not to obtain righteousness. That was never its purpose, never will be. Thirdly, it by itself cannot produce sanctification or righteousness in the walk of a believer. Keeping those things in mind, let's go now to the next section, which are the ten purposes that God gave the law to Israel. These purposes can be divided into three groups. That's why you'll notice in your handout that I have boxes around the numbers. So the first group is numbers one through four. There's four purposes all in the first group. The first group is theological purposes, theological purposes. In other words, concerning holiness and sin. Four ways in which the law teaches us concerning holiness and sin. These are theological purposes. The second group is national, referring to the nation of Israel. Purposes that dealt with the formation and the protection or growth of the nation of Israel. And then lastly, personal. There are aspects to the person, the individual within Israel that are addressed by the, the giving of the law. All right, let's go to the first one, theological again. The first purpose of the law that comes in this category is the law reveals the holiness of God, which is the standard of righteousness. Leviticus 11.44 For I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am holy. And you shall not make yourselves unclean with any of the swarming things that swarm on the earth, for I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. In that example, we see God describing Himself as holy, setting a standard for the nation, and through that standard, imploring them to be holy as I am holy through this standard. That's not the only way in which you're holy, of course. This is just one example. But it's teaching lessons of separation and distinction. They became examples in God's law to teach about holiness, to teach about the need to refrain from things that pollute or remove holiness. Number two, by contrast, the law also reveals and condemns the sinfulness of men. So it reveals and condemns our sinfulness. A couple of example quotes, Romans 3.20 and Romans 4.15. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Or in 4.15, for the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there is also no violation. So the law, by its very existence, tells us we are sinful and reveals the violations of sin that are already present in us. That's a very simple principle. We can understand it in real life all the time, right? Until someone tells me I can't do something, I didn't realize I was doing something wrong. The law sets the standard for fellowship with God. In other words, it defines the holiness level that men must obtain for entrance into heaven. It's the test you have to pass to get into heaven. The psalmist says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? 
He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to falsehood and has not sworn deceitfully, he shall receive a blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. So that psalmist makes clear who can be in the presence of the Lord, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. And if you want to read that more simply, the one who is sinless. So the law sets the standard for fellowship with God. And then lastly, the last theological reason. By setting such an impossibly high standard, an unapproachable, unachievable standard for entrance into heaven, the law will meet its ultimate theological purpose in leading men to recognize their need for a Messiah. When I tell you the standard's 100% and you've already failed, you know you have to look for a different solution. Paul says in Galatians 3.24, Therefore the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. And there's your connection back to one of our principles, right? The law never justifies anything. Never makes pure, never makes sinless, never makes righteous anything. So Paul says, once you understand that, by reading the law itself, you seek to be justified by some other means, by faith. So let's go to the second group of purposes. We said they were the national purposes for the law given to Israel. The first of those is the law and the covenant that delivered it was God's instrument for establishing Israel as God's chosen nation of people on earth. This is another reason, by the way, that we know that the law was given to Israel alone. Exodus 19, which we've already read. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. The law and the covenant that contained it was God's way of defining, selecting a group of people to be a nation set apart from all others. And then the second reason is then by the nature of what the law provided and required... It created a distinction or a uniqueness in Israel that made them totally different, totally peculiar to the rest of the world. They become a nation set apart from all other nations. By its structure, by its rules, by its provisions, Israel becomes so different from the rest of the world in their identity and in their culture that they can never again be one with the world. They can never again blend back in. And even today we see that. The law itself says in Leviticus 20, 24, Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. And then down in verse 26, thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. And then the seventh reason overall, the law instituted national worship observances, including certain festivals and the temple service. The law was Israel's order of service for worship. They had been introduced to their God. They had come to know him through the plagues and the exodus. They would become party to him in a covenant. They've now been selected as his people. Well, now what, God? How do we live with you? How do we worship you? How are we to interact with you? And the law comes along and says, here are all the ways in which you are to Worship me in the various services of your, of your life, of the temple life and of the festivals of community life. As an example, Leviticus 23, 4, God at one point says, These are the appointed times of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at the times appointed for them. And then from there in Leviticus 23, he goes on to give some of the festivals. And then finally, the law has purposes for the individual within Israel. And the first of those is it sets a standard of conduct for the Old Testament saint. It didn't create an Old Testament saint, but it was regulating the life of that Old Testament saint. So it becomes a standard of conduct for the Old Testament saint. And as they follow it, they are blessed by that standard. So it regulated individual conduct to yield blessing and to promote well-being. Psalms says this in the very first Psalm. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in its seasons, and its leaf does not wither. In whatever he does, he prospers. So it was a tool that the Lord used 
to promote holiness in the lives of Old Testament saints. Now, we're talking about Old Testament saints. Not everyone who sits in a church building today is a saint. Not all those who come to church are believers. Likewise, not everyone who was in Israel were saints. So we're talking about the effect of the law on the saint within Israel. The believer, the remnant. For those in that group who lived according to the law in a genuine desire to please the Lord, there was blessing to follow. That's what the psalmist is talking about. And that blessing was that the law itself promoted a, a, a prosperous life. It was an instruction manual for, for prosperous living. And then in response to that obedience, God would further bless the individual. But as we mentioned earlier, the law by itself did not produce sanctification. So during the dispensation of law, which is this period of history we're talking about, once the law was given to Israel, we were in a dispensation of law that governed the relationship of the saint and the Lord. And that dispensation of law continued until the dispensation of grace in the face of Christ specifically. So until Christ comes, Paul says you are under a tutor waiting for that day of adoption as sons. And so in this period of dispensation of law, the instrument God used to govern the lives of believers and bring them to prosperity in that way and blessing was the law. It did not make them believers. It did not produce sanctification in their heart, but it became a regulator for how they lived their life. Notice the psalmist says he delights in meditating on God's law. What does meditating in God's law suggest? Another way for, to say that would be studying God's Word. How do we turn to people today in the church and tell them they can be prosperous in their walk as Christians? How can they be pleasing to God in their walk as Christians? Wouldn't we say to them, study God's Word and do what it says? In the day that Israel started off in the first years of the, of the nation after the Exodus, all they had was the law. There's no prophets, there's no Psalms, there's just the five books of Moses. That's the Bible. What are you going to study if you're trying to study God's Word? You're going to meditate on His law. Today, if you're not careful, you read that as if the law itself was some magical part of the Bible that you need to study on as opposed to the rest of it. That's not what it's meaning at all. It's just meaning the natural thing an Old Testament saint or any saint would do is study God's Word. Whatever you have of it. And in their case, all they had was law. The law was God's Word for the Old Testament saint, and therefore it provided the same fuel for sanctification that the Word of God does for the New Testament saint today. The engine for your sanctification, the thing that causes you to become more holy and Christ-like, is the Holy Spirit. But the fuel for that engine is the Bible, is the Word of God. You can starve the engine and you won't get the same progress. What was the Old Testament fuel? The law of God. What was the Old Testament engine? The Holy Spirit as well, just not indwelling. And so the Old Testament saint needed to meditate on God's law as much as we study God's word. And in that process, it was regulating their life and guiding them into holiness. In fact, the giving of the law to Israel, interestingly, occurs 50 days after the crossing of the Red Sea when the Jews were freed from Pharaoh's army. The Feast of Weeks is given to Israel specifically to commemorate this time of escape from the Red Sea and their arrival at the mountain. But that feast, the Feast of Weeks, goes by a different name in the New Testament. We call it the Feast of Pentecost in the New Testament because it comes 50 days after the resurrection of Christ. In Greek, 50 days is the word Pentecost. In the book of Acts, we read that on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit arrives to indwell the hearts of all believers in the church. That moment in Acts, that moment of Pentecost, is the fulfillment of what the earlier Pentecost is intended to shadow. So, 50 days after Israel crosses the Red Sea and receives their baptism as a nation, they see a law come to them to regulate their lives as Old Testament saints. But that's a lesser form of something that would be fulfilled in greater ways, ultimately, in the church. So that 50 days after we were baptized into his death and resurrection, now the Pentecostal moment arrives and now we are given a law also, but one written on our hearts. The greater law written on our hearts is the fulfillment of what this lesser law written on stone is to the nation of Israel. 
Further evidence that one of the purposes of the law is to regulate the saint in the same way that we have a law written on our hearts to regulate us. That being the Holy Spirit's indwelling. So number nine, the second purpose within this last group. The law served as a test for whether a person was to be part of the kingdom of God. The law served as a test for whether someone was to be part of the kingdom of God. And by kingdom of God, I mean the theocracy of Israel. The theocracy of Israel. The theocracy of Israel is the nation state on earth ruled by God. It is itself a picture of the greater theocracy, the greater kingdom, which we all await when Jesus comes and rules in person. It's a lesser to that greater But in like way, it has its rules and order. And only certain people can be in the kingdom. Those who meet the standards. So, those who failed to abide by the law of Moses were to be removed from the nation of Israel and cut off from the people. In Numbers, for example, God says, but the person who does anything defiantly, defiantly meaning anything in which he purposely ignores or sets aside the law of Moses, whether he is a native or an alien, That one is blaspheming the Lord and that person shall be cut off from among his people because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken his commandment. That person shall be completely cut off. His guilt will be on him. Those who fail to abide by the law were to be removed from the nation of Israel, cut off from the people. And in that way, the law serves as a picture of what will happen in the eternal kingdom of Christ because only those who are perfectly righteous will be in the kingdom were made that way by faith in Christ. So in the time of Israel, it became a test for who would be part of the theocracy of Israel. And then lastly, the law's sacrificial system provided for personal atonement and restoration of fellowship in the aftermath of an unintentional sin. Leviticus 5.17 Now, if a person sins and does any of the things which the Lord has commanded not to be done, Anything. Though he was unaware, still he is guilty and shall bear his punishment. He is then to bring to the priest a ram without defect from the flock, according to your evaluation, for a guilt offering. And so the priest shall make atonement for him concerning his error, in which he sinned unintentionally and did not know it, and it will be forgiven him. So by observing the sacrificial system in the law, the Old Testament saint was commanded to confess their guilt and pay a personal price in the form of an animal. This process also required the priesthood to be a part of the process and to officiate over the process. And through that ritual atonement, the Old Testament saint had a tangible experience of how sin is met with sacrifice, which leads to forgiveness. You have to also remember the law made no provision for willful sin. Did you know that? There was no provision in the law for willful sin. The only provision that the law made in the sacrificial system was for unintentional sin. The point being, if you intentionally went off to sin, then you were cut off. David broke law. Solomon broke law. Every man broke law. Every man does it intentionally. God just said, I'm not making any provision for it in the law. Christ makes provision for all of it. Think about it. Why does he make no provision in law for intentional sin? Because people would just sin intentionally all the time. Then I'd just sit around and calculate, do I have enough pigeons to sin today? It just suddenly would become an economics problem. But if you tell me there is no provision for intentional sin except you being cut off from your people, now I'm not going to really have any way to to get around that. I might still do it, and obviously many did, but the point is God has not made license for it. He's not made a way available for it. He makes license for unintentional sin by saying, all right, when you mess up and it's not something you intended, okay, but it's guilt still on you, here's what I expect you to do. For those of you who want to go off and sin, I'm sorry, I'm making no provision for that. You don't get a free ride on that. That's the whole point. Go back and read the letter to the Hebrews again and reread it with that understanding and you see why he says, if anyone set aside the law of Moses on the testimony of two witnesses, they would be put to death. How much greater a penalty will there be for those of us who set aside the blood of the sacrifice by which we have been sanctified, who tread on the blood of Christ? You see his point, right? If the law said anyone who sets aside even one of God's commandments intentionally was cut off from his people, how bad do you think it is for those of us who, knowing God through Christ, set aside what we've been given? Then he follows that by saying it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
But in all of those things, you still need Christ's atoning work to save you because the law wasn't attempting to cover the sin eternally. It was attempting to give you the experience of forgiveness of a sacrifice made, a personal sacrifice made, a priest officiating to intercede for you in behalf of God who could then turn around after it was over and absolve you and give you confidence as you walked away that, yes, God is pleased with me again. What actually got God's pleasure? Your faith. But the means to experience it was the law during the dispensation of law. So this is the provision that was made for those who do not know they've sinned, but it's been brought to their attention somehow, and now they have this guilt they need to have to deal with. Remember, we're talking about saints again. If you're not already a saint, this is of no value to you. The law is for the saint in the time of Israel. For the saint, it matters whether you upset God or not. For the saint, it is important not to sin. For the saint, you care if you find out you've done the wrong thing. You want to have forgiveness. You want to have something that gives you the chance to walk away with a cleansed heart. We have that in the form of the assurance of Scripture that we are already forgiven that the one and only and necessary sacrifice has been done for our sakes. So we don't have that guilt of, now what do I do to make up for it? We know it's been made up for already. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit reminds us, our tangible experience of sacrifice made for atonement is the Spirit in us giving us that understanding, of assuring us of our salvation. But think how it would work for you if you had no Spirit indwelling and the Messiah had not even yet come. Where do you go for that assurance? Imagine a life in Israel as a saint with no sacrificial system. Where do you go for that? We know that the sacrificial system itself did not actually obtain God's forgiveness or produce righteousness in the individual. The Lord's forgiveness for sin was a matter of faith only made possible by the future atonement of Christ on the cross. But during the dispensation of law, Prior to that sacrifice of Christ, the rituals of the law served an incredibly important purpose, both foreshadowing Christ's work, explaining it in a sense, helping understand the need for it, but also through those rituals, demonstrating to the individual themselves personal repentance and evidence of God's forgiveness. To the individual who had nothing else to go by, nothing else to touch, no history to refer to, no spirit to teach them. When they felt the guilt of their sin, they needed some way to know God's forgiveness. And God made one available through law. Not the reality of His forgiveness, but the experience of His forgiveness. The reality was through Christ. But yet they still needed the experience to know God understands my sin and has made provision for it. And I can walk away from the temple without the guilt. And yet the next week they'd be back in that same position again. Though they had a means, it was an insufficient means. Though they had a a tangible proof, it was a proof that faded. And so it required continual sacrifice. And in that it served its purpose, but it also demonstrated its weakness so that we'd never confuse it for the real thing. By the same token, it's easy, I think, for Christians to minimize the importance of that sacrificial system to the individual. We explain it as a picture of Christ. We understand it as a way of foreshadowing Christ's sacrifice and so on and so on. But don't minimize the importance to the individual worshiper for how it influenced their growth and their dependence on God. They knew they had his forgiveness. So its purpose then, it was added because of transgressions. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise has been made. So today we have no need for such rituals. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't take animals and sacrifice them because we don't need those things to regulate our relationship with the Lord or to have a tangible evidence of His forgiveness. We have the greater sacrifice of Christ already in terms of history. It's already happened. So we can all point back to that. So in place of the the Lamb, I look back to the Lamb of God. And in place of that need to feel absolved by the priest and the temple service. Instead, I get the indwelling of the Spirit speaking to me like He does to every saint, both convicting me of my sin, so the law is in me telling me where I did mess up, and then simultaneously I have the assurance of forgiveness that His very presence is proof of. Paul says all who have the Spirit of God are the sons of God. 
If you're being led by the Spirit of God, then you are a son of God, Paul says. So in other words, the very presence of the Spirit is also my assurance. It works from both sides at the same time. So Christ's sacrifice made possible a new spirit living in me, giving me a clear conscience without the need for repeated sacrifices, but also gave me a continual conviction of sin because he is a law in himself, or he is the law written on my heart, which means at every turn as I make mistake, I feel the conviction wherever that happens. Versus the Old Testament saint who had to rely on the law as it existed externally to regulate what was right and what was wrong. And it did it at a lesser level and at an imperfect level compared to what we have access to today. Last quote, Hebrews 9.13, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled those who had been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, if you could take animals and with their blood and their ashes, sprinkle those on people who had been sinful, and through that process, give them a cleansing, but notice it's a cleansing of flesh, which is a way of saying it's not a spiritual cleansing, it just made them feel good, which was its purpose. Then he says, verse 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The law had great purpose to the individual worshiper because it was the only thing they had. We have surpassed what they had with something far greater, the thing that it was pointing to all along, that was the fulfillment all along. So there is no need for the earlier. What good is that anymore? I have the much greater one now. So that's the last of the ten purposes. Now you see very clearly in that a very complex set of reasons why Israel benefited from the law. Theological reasons that gave them understandings of sin and, and holiness and, and aspects of their relationship to God that they would never have had otherwise. It moved then to a national or corporate application that showed them how to be a nation, how to worship Him together. It defined who was in the nation. It's like their constitution. And then lastly, it became the way in which God regulated the life of the saint. The final topic is, how does a Christian relate to the law now? First, as we studied already, the law was given by way of a covenant made with Israel. So only Jews were party to this covenant. So only Jews were obligated to keep the law. Gentiles were never under the law unless they attached themselves to Israel. All humanity will be judged by the law on their death. Only one group of people was asked to actually try to keep it. They couldn't keep it any better than the people who didn't know about it. But the point is, only one group was even asked to try. Once Christ came and inaugurated the new covenant in His blood, that wall of separation between the Jew and the Gentile was broken down. What wall am I talking about? Well, specifically, the wall of the law itself. The law was the wall. It was the way that the nation was separated from the rest of the world, right? Ephesians 2, 11 through 15 but once Christ came, that separation that the law created was removed. And then Paul says this in Ephesians 2.11, Therefore remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. That's a pretty all-encompassing statement, by the way. If you were a Gentile, prior to the coming of Christ, this is how your life looked. You were separated from Christ. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant of promise. You had no hope, and you were without God in the world. God had only revealed Himself to the Jews. And then verse 13, But now, in Christ Jesus, you, who were formerly far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace who made both groups, and He's referring to Jew and Gentile, has made both groups into one and broken down the barrier of the dividing wall. Now, what was that barrier? He describes it. Verse 15, by abolishing in His flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in Himself He might make the two into one new man and thus establishing peace. Paul's point is that when Christ came, part of what the coming of Christ and the death of Christ achieved is it put an end to law. And by the putting of an end to the law, these two groups now are no longer separated. If you're a saint, 
Remember, we've only ever been talking about saints now. Old Testament saints. Now we're moving into the New Testament saints. If you're a New Testament saint who's a Jew and you're a New Testament saint who's a Gentile, since the law doesn't exist anymore, there's no defining difference between you anymore because the law has been removed. And we know this because in verse 15, Paul says that that dividing wall was the law and that it caused Israel to be set apart. So if God is going to open up the family of God to all men, he has to do away with the thing that is keeping the rest of the world out. If his whole intent is to bless all nations of the world through the seed of Abraham, then at some point he had to get rid of the thing, the barrier that was the cause for separating people and keeping some out. That was the law. It was the law. So when anyone argues with you about whether the law really truly exists or not, if it did, you and I couldn't have fellowship with Jewish believers. So the law is abolished for those who believe. The New Testament believer is not commanded to keep the law. That's why Paul teaches in Romans and in Galatians and elsewhere that the believer is not under law, but under grace instead. How can this be? How can the law that we said everybody is judged by, even those who don't have it, How can it just go away? Well, because it's a trick question. It doesn't go away. It's fulfilled. It's fulfilled. Jesus himself testified to this in Matthew 5.17. Do not think I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. What does it mean that he fulfills the law? Well, simply put, Christ met all of the holiness requirements of the law. As a Jew himself... Christ was subject to the terms of the covenant. Isn't that interesting to think about this? God himself made that covenant with men. When Christ came born as man, he was subject to his own covenant. And he did it. He kept it perfectly. He had to keep all the statutes of his own law codified in that covenant. And he did so by living a sinless life. Now do you see one of the reasons the covenant was given with the law in it? Why make one group of people try to keep this law through a covenant that binds them to keep it? So that when the Messiah comes through that people, he can fulfill the very requirement he put on himself and keep it perfectly. Christ, therefore, lives the sinless life that fulfills the law's requirements. Then he goes a step further. Christ bears the punishment for sin committed under the law, even though he himself did not have any sin to pay for. He took it upon himself to be a cursed man under law. And the law itself says he has to be that way. Deuteronomy 21, 22. The law itself says this. If a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he is put to death and you hang him on a tree, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God. So in other words, God defined anyone who would die by hanging on a tree as a cursed person. So that when Christ came and died on a tree, he could be considered cursed for our sake. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. As Paul said, he became sin for me so that I might become his righteousness. God literally swaps His righteousness and my sin. I get His righteousness. He took my sin. He went to the cross cursed in my place. I get seen. I'm not actually this way, but I get seen from God's point of view as having the righteousness of Christ on me. How did He get that righteousness? By living the law perfectly. So why do you and I not have to try to keep law in this dispensation of grace? Because you can't do better than Christ did. You can't improve on 100% perfection. If he's already done everything the law requires and done it perfectly, what's your point or my point in trying to come behind him and do the same thing a second time? Especially when you know you can't. It's like somebody else taking the test for you. You don't need to show up yourself. Not in the sense of trying to keep the commandments of the law. So I stop trying to keep the law. He's already done it for me. How much are you going to do better? That then means we go back to one of our first principles that we studied tonight, that the law is a single entity of 613 laws, not just a section or two, it's the whole thing. So if he's fulfilled the whole thing, then the whole thing no longer applies. And in fact, since we break the whole law every time we break even just one of them, any of our efforts to keep the law amount to nothing more than simply greater condemnation. 
If you set out to actually try to keep the law, all you're doing is showing yourself to be a lawbreaker over and over and over again. Instead, we're told not to even bother with that anymore, not to try to keep law, but to rest in Christ's works instead, accepting his righteousness credited to us and then start following the new law you've been given. What's the new law? Well, the new law is the law written on our hearts. What about Israel? The Israel you see today, not the believing remnant of Israel, not the saint of today, because we call them the Christian, but the Jew of today who is not a believer. Are they under law? Yes, the law still exists. The covenant is still in force. The terms of that covenant continue to have effect on Israel, and especially as they reach into the time of tribulation. Meanwhile, though, for every believer, whether Jew or Gentile, the law has been fulfilled. You could also say completed on our behalf by Christ. There's nothing more we can do to accomplish it. So when you hear the believers are not to observe law, you reach this point for many that is a point of difficulty. And the point of difficulty is, if people don't have law, won't they just run amok? And usually, in an attempt to prove that point, some will throw out this question. Well, are you trying to say, Stephen, that it's okay for a Christian to murder now? If you're telling me the Ten Commandments don't apply, are you saying I'm free to go murder? First, that question is clearly ridiculous. Let's just put that out first. That's clearly a ridiculous question because we know the answer is no. Murder is sin. And no Christian is going to feel free to murder simply because someone tells them they're not under the law of Moses. It's a ridiculous prospect. But the question is useful for our discussion because it exposes two false assumptions that are common in the church concerning law. First, the question assumes that the Ten Commandments are treated differently than the other 613. You notice how no one ever says, well, are you telling me, Steve, that I don't have to sacrifice rams anymore? No one seems to want to hold on to those, do they? But those first ten, we think we have to preserve. All the laws have been fulfilled. All of them, therefore, are gone. And by the way, it works both ways. If you tell me that you can't accept that, if you say, no, I absolutely believe the first ten commandments still must be true and must be something I observe, then if you tell me that, then you are also arguing, whether you realize it or not, you are arguing for the need to observe the other 603 laws as well. As Paul says in Galatians 4.21, tell me, you who want to be under law, do you not listen to the law? <laughs> so those who feel the need to preserve some of the law in any part of the Christian experience are actually showing their ignorance of that very law. In reality... You can't separate those laws apart from one another. So if you want to be held to the ten, you're also required to hold to the other 603. The second problem with that question is, it assumes that the purpose of the Ten Commandments was to compel righteous behavior. When someone says you can't throw away the Ten Commandments, what they're assuming is that the whole purpose for God giving them was to ensure that you didn't murder. That's not what they were for. Let's take murder, for example. When someone says, is it okay for Christians to murder? They are suggesting that Christians today are refraining from murdering because of the Ten Commandments. That's implied, right? Otherwise, you're saying it would be a bad thing if I take it away. You're telling me, Steve, that you're giving people license to murder. Well, it's a myth to think that Christians have been protected from sin by the mere existence of the Ten Commandments. There is not a single commandment on that list that every Christian in this room has not broken. And if you're confused about that, let me point it out. You've all used the Lord's name in vain, whether in speech or in thought. You have all broken the Sabbath. You have all lied or been dishonest in some way. You have all dishonored your parents in some way. You have all lusted in your heart or been sexually impure at some point. You have all taken something that is not yours at some point, even if it's just leaving early from work. You have all coveted another person's property or harbored desires for another person's spouse, even if only for a second in your heart. You have all served idols in various ways and at various times. And I've done all of those things, too. So the Ten Commandments never kept anyone out of sin, much less out of hell. So preserving them doesn't serve any good purpose with regard to righteousness. The law does not make us holy. It can only reveal the sinfulness of who we truly are. The words look nice on a plaque on courthouse steps. But when... But when we revere the Ten Commandments, we are idolizing the very thing that condemns us. Not the thing that makes us holy. As Hebrews sums up, in contrasting the law and the old covenant with the new covenant in Christ, here's what he says, Hebrews 7.18, For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weaknesses and its uselessness. Uselessness. 
For the law made nothing perfect. And, on the other hand, there is a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. So we'll pick up next week with the last point to how we have a law written on our hearts, how that law does guide us into righteousness today, how it substitutes and takes the place for anything that was in the old. And then from there we'll go into the actual law itself in the first Ten Commandments. Father, we thank you for another robust night of, of uh, discussion and, and teaching and an opportunity, Father, to see things new and in a better way. Father, help us understand that because you have fulfilled law, we have moved on to something greater that is more demanding, not less, that calls us to greater things, not lesser. And help us, Father, to uh, live in the grace that you've given us. Bring us back next week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.